Laura Silverman of the Outside Institute, welcome to Women of the Catskills Project on Upstate Dispatch. Thank you. It's very nice to be here. It's great to have you here. So how has your year been? It's been so different for everyone. Well, I have to say that this year for me has been strangely good. I mean, the pandemic really hasn't altered my life all that much. I, for the last decade, I've lived in a small cabin. I work from home and I spend a lot of time in the woods and that really hasn't changed significantly. But of course, what's going on in the world has been deeply affecting. Um, I've got a lot of compassion for what people are going through and we are all witness to a lot of suffering and, and the collective anxiety really is palpable. Um, and of course, I do miss gathering with friends and family like everybody. And for me, especially, I miss taking groups of people for walks for the Outside Institute. Um, how, why have you necessarily had to stop those walks if they're outdoors and you can be socially distant? Because the way I teach makes it very difficult to be socially distant. We're looking at the minutia of leaves, insects, uh, moss, and I noticed the last walk that I led in April, uh, we saw a wonderful snake and suddenly all the heads went completely uh, non-socially distanced as everyone was trying to look at the same thing at the same time. And I realized, you know, although ideally we would be able to stay three to six feet apart, the reality is when you're trying to teach people about seeing things in very minute detail, it really doesn't make sense. And I would rather err on the side of caution and protect other people's health. Yeah. So have you become more or less productive or disciplined during this pandemic? Oh, I'm the same as ever, really. You know, I'm as a self-employed writer, naturalist, and uh, creative consultant, I've always worked from home and I had to maintain a very strong discipline. And so things feel relatively the same. I mean, in some ways, it's kind of exciting for me to see how normalized Zoom meetings have become because it really has enabled me to see more people on a daily basis than what I'm used to, not in the flesh, but at least making eye contact is possible. So as an entrepreneur, I'm accustomed to generating my own work and, and I've been busier than ever this year. Mm, a lot of people have reported being busier than ever. And a lot of people have reported up here in the Catskills, they say, say things to me like, that's, that was always my MO, shelter in place. So nothing really has changed much for me. Um, but tell us about the Outside Institute. Um, when did it start and um, what is it? what services does it provide? Yeah, I founded the Outside Institute in 2017. So coming up on four years this spring. And really it was just an extension of my own love of nature. I spend a lot of time outside. I'm self-taught about a botany and mycology and um, every year I'm learning a little bit more. And I got to a certain point where I felt like I had enough that I could share with other people. And I was hearing from a lot of friends and acquaintances in this area that they wanted to be outside but they didn't know where to go and if they did get outside they didn't understand what they were seeing and so while i'm don't really think of myself as an expert um i think pursuit of this kind of knowledge is a lifelong endeavor i did feel like i had enough to help people get started so Really, I lead guided walks and take people into the different ecosystems and landscapes that we have here in the beautiful Catskills and share with them what I know about the flora, fauna, and fungi, as I say. Um, we also do um, some workshops teaching different wild crafting skills. Um, I bring in guest instructors. We do things on natural dyeing and um, herbal medicine, herbal cosmetics, things like that. And then we've also published two volumes of our field guide to the Hudson Valley and Upper Delaware Valleys. It's sort of a regional field guide that's really good for novices. And 
um, I thought it was important to create a different kind of field guide because I was hearing that a lot of people feel intimidated by these very dense field guides that have a lot of botanical language and a lot of Latin, um, and they're not necessarily that specific to the region. And so we created very simple guides um, that also, in addition to helping people identify the plants and understand their characteristics, we tell a little bit about um, their importance in folk culture and um, the, with the indigenous cultures and how they um, have been used medicinally and for craft and things like that. I feel like it helps people get a closer connection to these plants and, and a wider understanding of them. So, so yeah, field guides and also some uh, botanical products that I produce in small quantities, mostly for pop-up markets and things like that. Tinctures, bitters, medicinal things, delicious things. So um, what are some of the things you're selling at the holiday markets this season? Yeah, I'm only doing one market this year. Um, a lot of the, the markets aren't really happening because of the pandemic. Um, but I'm doing a little pop-up um, at uh, Mayor Wassner in Narrowsburg. It's my friend Pam's beautiful shop. She sells clothing and jewelry, and I've done little events there before. She supports me, and uh, she asked me to come in, and um, she used to, she was one of the founders of Indie Mart, a, a holiday market that happened in Narrowsburg every year, and they shut that down last year was the last year. They weren't planning on doing it this year anyway, which turned out kind of well for them, I think, but she's invited me to come and bring my wares there, and I'll be there this coming weekend. Uh, Saturday and Sunday, the 19th and 20th of December from 11 to five. And I'll have my field guides and a big collection of vintage field guides that I've been compiling. Ooh. I'll have my cacao shell tea infused with spice bush berries, um, sea salt caramels, um, black walnut bitters, cow parsnip bitters, and some medicinal tinctures made with reishi and lemon balm and some St. John's word oil, things Ooh. like that. What made you choose those particular products to sell or make? I thought cow parsnip was poisonous. Is <laughs> no, it's not poisonous. It's a delicious edible. Um, and the seeds that it makes are extremely aromatic um, and pungent in flavor and have been used medicinally by the native peoples for colds and flu. Um, you may be thinking that um, if you get some of the juice of the plant on your skin, and then the skin is exposed to sunlight, it can cause some burning. And that's very common with all of the plants in the APACA family, um, like giant hogwort and um, even carrot will do that. Oh, really? Even carrot? Mm -hmm. oh. So what do you recommend to take for the winter, winter ailments, like the winter blues? I mean, I'm sure if we've all gonna get the winter blues, cabin fever. What sort of tinctures and stuff do you recommend? I recommend fresh air. I recommend getting outside and moving around and being in the light and um, watching the birds and enjoying the dawn and the sunset and infusing your spirit and your body with all of the wonderful medicinal values that that has. Um, certainly there are tinctures and other things that we can take to support ourselves. But the number one thing I, I recommend is getting outside. Yes, fresh air and some sunlight. It's uh, better, Be it's better out there for sure. How much time do you spend outdoors? Well, I try to get outside every single day. Uh, some days it's just for a half an hour walk around the property. Some days it's for much longer walks. I really looking forward to tomorrow's forecasted snowfall because I love to snowshoe. Um, wasn't able to do much of that last year. So hoping for lots of snow this winter. <laughs> well, we certainly do have a lot of winter up here. We have a lot of winter, especially up here. I'm on a mountain top and it's six months of winter and I'm having to install a hoop house so I can extend my growing season because it's just oh, wow. too depressing to only be able to grow for a couple of months out of the year. Yeah, I um, hear that. I mean, it's you know, a lot of people ask me, you know, well, I don't, you know, it's cold outside. I don't want to go out. And uh, I remind them that the Swedes say there's no bad, no such thing as bad weather, only bad, bad clothing. Mm. So if you're appropriately attired, you're able to get out in every season. And, um, and there's so many beautiful things to see 
people are like, well, what you, can you see? It's all covered in snow. Well, the snow reveals all the animal tracks. That's one really fun thing to do. And it's a great way to hike because if you can hike later on in the day, you can follow the tracks of the previous person. That's true. Um, if you are going to, you know, say an unmarked trail or um, a trailless peak, you can follow in the footsteps of the more experienced expert hikers that, that have gone before you. Hopefully, if you yeah. know that who they are for sure. Well, I'm good. eagerly awaiting the end of hunting season this week because uh, it makes it a little bit trickier to go out on those unmarked trails. Yes, that's right. Always wear orange um, in the winter. So what can we find? What can we find out there in the winter? Any edibles? Anything that you can pick? Yeah, absolutely. There's uh, rose hips. We have a multiflora rose that is an introduced species and it's quite ubiquitous. Small rose hips are wonderful. You bring those home and put those into some hot water, steep them for tea. It's a nice infusion of vitamin C. And of course, all the conifers are also loaded with vitamin C. You can make a tea with the needles from hemlock, eastern white pine, spruce. Add a little honey to that too. That's delicious. Mm. Wintergreen is, um, as its name indicates, green all year round and has that wonderful, people are always like, I have them nibble on a leaf and they say, is a toothpaste, mouthwash? It's wintergreen. <laughs> Tastes good, very refreshing snack. Um, I also love the bark that shags off the shag bark hickory tree. You can toast that in the oven and, and simmer that in water. It makes a beautiful, aromatic, smoky, slightly sweet tea. Mm -hmm. there's, there's always things to find. And for those interested in medicinals, you can keep an eye out for chaga, which is the fungus that grows on birch trees in this area. Mm. Only birch? Yes. Only birch. Uh, the, on, the only chaga that I ever come across is really old, sadly. I've never... Well, the, age, the, the age doesn't matter. I mean, the chaga really? is extremely hard. It looks like burnt cork. And so it doesn't have a young period. You just oh. uh, chip off some small pieces and simmer that in water for about four to six hours. Mm. And that makes a, a very nu nutrient-dense uh, tea that is good for preventing cancer, boosting the immune system. Mm. I found a lot of reishi this year. Reishi, yes. Rose on hemlock, absolutely. That you want when it's young. Yes. This was a banner year for reishi. I think the universe understood that we needed that healing that it offers. Yes. So what's, what is your winter schedule looking like? Personally or for the Outside Institute? The outside, and personally and the Outside Institute. Well, personally, I plan to take a couple of weeks off over the holidays and just do a little bit of relaxing, sitting in front of the fire, reading some books, catching up with friends over the phone or on walks together. Um, and as far as the Outside Institute, I'm not going to be leading any walks, although at this time I have been leading many, many private walks, which I'm still able to do. So I've probably walked with 30 or 40 different people since the spring, seen um, a lot of people have moved up here from the city full time or have rented places um, up here. And so there's a lot of interest in their new properties or what's going on in this area. So I've Led a lot of private walks and I'll still be doing those um, in every season. And I'm also going to hunker down and work on the third and final volume of our field guide, the fall winter volume that will come out next year. Great. What are you going to be cooking over the holidays? Cooking over the holidays. Wow. Well, it's a bit of a conundrum, isn't it? If you're home alone or as I am just with my husband, so there was no big turkey for Thanksgiving or anything like that. Um, I always make a steamed pudding with persimmon and hard sauce. Wow. That's what we'll be having for um, dessert on Christmas Day. And I like to make a lot of Japanese hot pots at this time of year. I have a donabe, one of those clay cookers. And um, you just put in a lot of vegetables and a dashi broth and um, some seafood maybe, maybe some noodles. Um, it's a wonderful way to eat. I don't eat a lot of meat. Um, my husband does. So 
we may be having parallel Danabes going with different ingredients in them. But this is a time of year for me for a lot of stews, soups, things like that. And um, I do have a lot of wild foraged mushrooms from this past year that are dried and I'll be tossing those into a lot of things as well. Mm, and yes, you have to dry everything. Where do you get persimmons? Do you? At the market. I don't have lo a local source for those. I wish. Yes, me too. Yeah, it's, ha it's been a great year for mushrooms um, and I am becoming more and more obsessed with mushrooms as the months and the years go by because <laughs> they're so good for you and they, the flavor just reminds you of the earth. You know, it's such an earthy grounding flavor and uh, I've really been enjoying mushroom everything this past year. People are crazy for, for mushrooms. There really seems to be a, a real upsurge in the interest in the world of fungi. And um, if you haven't seen Fantastic Fungi, the film, I recommend it highly. I'm gonna go and watch that right now. Well, Laura Silverman of the Outside Institute, thank you for coming on the show. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you, Jenny. <laughs>